Hey guys. All right, we are recording. So, John, catch us up with this. Where's the story today? <laughs> sure. So, to answer the question, Ben, it was maybe a few meetings ago uh, when it, I think there was a, maybe some consensus that things are just kind of a little bit of stagnant. And someone, I don't recall whom, made the suggestion of maybe we ought to focus on the CRD and use try to come up with the CRD, define a spec, and use that as a try to way to move forward. And if we can arrive at agreement on that around the design, so it's taking a top-down approach and, and then look and then work our way into from there getting into implementation and, and code. And I think that there was a general consensus that that seemed like a reasonable approach. And uh, so then last week, I presented a initial very much work in progress doc on trying to focus on, well, actually prior to last week, I presented, we went through a Google doc where I went through some, I tried to group sections of the CRDs of InstaCluster, um, um, Datastax, and Orange operators by logical grouping of, of various sections of the CRD. So for example, to Cassandra topology, storage, uh, Cassandra configuration, and, and try to um, compare and contrast. But it, but it was, I was looking for least common areas where there is the most in common, I guess. So it wasn't, well, this operator has X, but this one has Y. It was, let me just focus on the areas where there's the most commonality. And then last week, it was, we tried to move it forward a bit into, uh, I tried to move some of that into a uh, document in the Git repo with actually trying to formalize it with defining some uh, Go types and um, and then there was a lot of good conversation and questions around that. And we decided to continue again with that this week. And the focus last week was specifically around topology. And so the plan was, or my, my take on is that we would continue with that. And, uh, I had, um, also wanted to try to move, keep things moving. And so looking at what else, you know, could we, so I don't want to, I don't want to just spend the entire time or, well, if we spend the whole time, the whole meeting on, on that, great. But I also started, I wanted us to keep moving forward and looking at other aspects. And so I started looking at storage configuration for volumes and have a, another work in progress document to, to discuss. And, I had um, pinged Cyril last night because there's, I think there's a lot, lot more. There's, from what I had looked at, I'd say there's probably some pretty more advanced things going on with what Cascop's doing. And so I'd asked him if he could, when we get talked about that, go over some of the things that, that they've done with, that Orange has done with, uh, around storage with, with Cascop. And uh, so that brings us up to, to date. Okay, cool. Well, I, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for catching me up on, on that. And um, I, I, I think that that kind of makes a, a ton of sense. Um, I, you know, I, I want I want to be <laughs> very, very respectful of, of um, the, the work that everyone's done in the last few weeks and acknowledge that I haven't been on, on some of these calls. But would it would it be all right if I asked a few blunt questions to the group? fire away that's why we're here um yeah um so like you know i, I like the idea of a, a crd first approach as it, as it is you know it's, it's it's very collaborative and it brings in a lot of um you, you know I, I guess everyone together to work towards a, a, a common design and that kind of thing um you know i also just want to you know reflect on the fact that i think everyone here you know in, in this meeting has 
more or less have already written an operator, right? And I, I wonder if it would it would maybe make sense to you know solicit uh, you know a, a call from all the participants, the people who do have operator IP, to just straight up make a donation of of, of that IP so we can get something kind of on the on the on the sorry just a take cut. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so <clears throat> with a donation, it means we get some runs on the board, right? We get something that's, that's working. We get some code in place. Uh, and then we could potentially leverage the CRD design to, dr to drive, you know, what, whatever we end up with um, and, and drive that towards, you know, kind of more of that, that optimal design right and you know that that optimal operation right um you know and yeah so i, I guess that was the, the the question i i would after that long ramble i would put to the group is, is ha, have we excluded accepting an ip donation uh and then just working off that whatever or whoever that comes from Um, John, you want to take this or you want me to, or I think you're probably more involved in the... Sure. Well, I think this was, and I, I don't know, Ben, if you were at the meeting, I, I think there was some, dis a lot more, a lot of discussion on exactly this. There was one of the meetings that uh, Josh McKenzie attended to provide some perspective around just with dealing with open sourcing community in, in general and trying to offer some suggestions and not specific to uh, the the operator itself and I, I think where we and I, I'll let other you know I don't at the risk of speaking for others I, I think there's I think people would be more than happy to make a donation but I think at the same time that there is some reluctance at um, leaving work behind and I, I can I absolutely understand and respect that uh, because everyone's worked really hard on their respective operator projects. Uh, and so I think that's where things are kind of at a standstill. And so I, I'm not sure if there's, I'm not sure how receptive the idea of starting from basically starting from, I, I hate to say starting from scratch, but, 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 you know, it's, it's, not just simply saying, well, we're going to take the code code base of this operator and use that as a starting point, but starting and, and, and it's not really starting from scratch because it's the, the, the knowledge and experience, the domain knowledge that I think is the most important. Um, and so with, with that in mind, then the suggestion was made about focusing on the CRD as a way to move things forward. And then taking IP donations based on that. Yeah. So probably a longer route, Ben, but I think it's this, it is a far more, I think it's a, it's a, it's a longer approach, but it has a lot more um, merit in the long term if we're taking multiple donations, because that's what it's coming down to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like, I, and I think the multiple donations uh, approach makes sense, you know, with the easy to kind of carve out feature set. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, it's just, I guess the, 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 fr the from starting from scratch or, or, you know, the longer design process, I, I just, I just have some concern about, you know, what, you know, like the, the appetite to, to work and, and, and build on some of that capability, right? Um, and, and, you know, like, I guess for, for the record around, I guess, the, you know, the work left behind concept and, and, and that, you know, our perspective at InstaCluster is 100% to, to centralize around whatever the official community operator kind of comes. Like, you know, we're very much leaving our, our ego at the door with the, um, and, you know, I, I think 
you know, and, and this comes from me a, a little bit more on the, uh, um, you know, think, thinking about this as a capability for the community. And, you know, I, I think one of my primary concerns here is, is about velocity and kind of getting those runs on the board. Um, and, you know, so I guess that's my particular perspective. I'm, I'm kind of coming at it um, from, um, you know, but I think if, you know, if everyone feels like they've got a solid path to, you know, even if we do a little bit of this upfront design, but then accept multiple donations based on that, that might be a good happy medium between, you know, I think some of the drive I feel for momentum, um, but I think the community's broader requirement to, you know, kind of go about this in a, in a more um, equitable manner. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a matter of starting from scratch in this method. And I get you. I mean, yeah, we don't want to start with a blank repo and build from there. I mean, that. I think the intent here is to um, just be really clear. Like, this is everyone's chance to dump a little technical debt. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe if you don't want to admit it, that's kind of, I see that as part of the process too. It's like, okay, there might be some things that are better for a community style operator. But I, I just feel like, and I, I would love to hear a rebuttal is that once we get to this place that most of the code that is needed to make, to reflect the CRD is already written. Is that true? It depends on the CRD. The closer you are from the one existing operator, the more likely you, you are to have any, a working code. Uh, to come back on what Ben said, I mean, we, we mentioned earlier that we wanted to, we were happy to, to make a donation of Cascop's code. We are still discussing how to do that internally, because it's not something that Orange does uh, often. But we're quite, quite positive it's going to be possible. And uh, our view is now that we have, we are currently uh, finishing the backup and restore functionalities with Instacluster's help. So uh, once that is done, for us, Cascop will be feature complete uh, and uh, would be a, a prime uh, candidate for donation. Now, when we discuss the CRDs, if we, if we see that we are not, uh, if Cascop is too far from the, the, the CRD, there would be no point in doing that. But my, my understanding is that by discussing options like you mentioned earlier, John, uh, about volumes. Uh, now, I think there are five or six uh, domains that we can talk about, like, for example, uh, um, bootstrapping the, the image and uh, uh, we, how, how we choose the image. We have two different approaches which uh, that are very actually uh, complementary, I think. Um, there is the, the administration side of, of uh, Cassandra that we can have a look at. Uh, some backup and restore, obviously. So I think we could go through those sub chapter, one per meeting, and try to, to progress on that side. So in three or four weeks, we could, uh, we could be done. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think that's a ambitious, but reasonable. Well, we don't know. Yeah, ambitious. No, I, I, I think. Well, I think that sounds. I think that sounds good. Like you know, I think. You know, and 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 apologies, all. I know this is part of me just getting up to speed, and you know, it is one of the drawbacks of of the Zoom versus the Dev Lift stuff and the catch up side of things. But um, you know, it sounds like it's kind of a good happy medium are around, you know, hey, reusing everything we've built, but, you know, um, <clears throat> kind of being able to take, you know, the best parts of different pieces that we've got, you know, available as options to us. All right. Well, I mean, no, I, and I actually appreciate that, Ben. It's always good to have a level set, you know, um, and I, I, I appreciate your leadership in this too. I mean, you, you've, been doing this for a long time and it's it's good to just make sure that we're all on the right page here not the same page the right page <laughs> um, 
but good. Um, well, should we continue with what we were going to work on? I, I think that's that's where we're at. Um, so, uh, John, sounds good. Okay. You okay. Have maybe other questions you got? Maybe, but then. Yeah, and let um, uh, I need to share my screen. Let, let me find those questions. I have them. I, I went and I uh, watched the video so I could make some notes and then make some changes. And then while I'm doing that, I also mentioned that if anyone hadn't noticed, Frank put a couple of polls on the Slack channel and I. My apologies, Trump, that I just, I got tied up with other things and had completely forgotten about them. But um, so I, I um, it's good to see more activity on Slack. All right, let me. Yeah, I was just trying to get the, I mean, I have a question and if people could say yes, no, we could have a view of what they want, but there needs to be answers. So. All right, let me share my screen. All right. Um, so I went through and there were a lot of questions and comments related to the doc that I shared in the last meeting and I didn't have a chance. I wasn't able to, to take notes as the meeting was going. So I went back and, and watched the video and, and made some notes. Uh, the, I, I think, and I'll, and I'll flip over to the document in, in a moment, but I think there are some of the, the, in my mind, there are a couple key questions, which was around, well, actually, let me, yeah, there was, in the, in the design, I had four, I had a, a, a data center type and the cluster type, and within the cluster type allowed the data centers to be declared in line as well as by essentially using references and there was uh, a lot of questions around the implications of the you know how that would work about them being defined in line and the other other area the on a related note some questions came up around and i in the doc i mentioned about having the I don't know if the right way to the right terminology is a, a distinct kind or resource for data center as well as the, the cluster, which would implied having a separate controller for each. Um, and I decided not to spend a whole lot of time on that. I didn't want to get too hung up on that, but I, with respect to the defining the data centers inline versus reference, um, I it seemed that there was more uh, the, the more of the, the questions and points that were raised that suggested it was um, more problematic. And so uh, I left, so when I updated the doc, let me, let me switch over. All right, I'll scroll down. Uh, so I left that out of the doc for now. Um, now, if somebody, if I'm happy to resume the discussion around that, but I, and to be in full transparency, I just didn't have the, the time this past week to go through a more deep analysis on the pros and cons of that beyond what were discussed last week. Um, and what I did do was, but I did provide some more examples to show, and, and it's at a, a minimal, a minimal spec for the cluster, where simply just defining the, the data center name and the number of nodes per rack. And so what would be implied there is it's still using racks, um, and, and then showing below another, another example of using, specifying the racks but not using any labels for uh, use for in effect for um, pinning nodes to zones. And then the 
example that I, the only example that I had previously was the next one, or I'm sorry, but I had another example, which was a, a single data center where you, with uh, zone aware, and then one with multiple zones. Um, oh, there were a couple of other questions that came up around default setting, what, you know, what are, what defaults should be used? And I wanted to address, so I, I call out a couple of those are some good questions. I think Patrick raised a couple of questions around that, around, like, for example, the what snitch or how should the snitch be configured? And I put in here um, using gossiping property file snitch. Uh, and then about configure, what about configuring seeds? Um, and then I had just put automatically configured by the operator. Um, I think I have to double check that in Cascop. I think I want to, well, I think in some of the operators, you, maybe you can configure that. Maybe in one or some of them, it's not. So yeah. um, happy yeah. to discuss that. I can answer the question for Cascop. So Cascop does it uh, by default, but we have multi Cascop on top of it. And it can override the seeds because we can have, I mean, multi Cascop is used for multi data centers uh, where, I mean, multi Kubernetes clusters. So they don't know each other. So the multi Cascop just set the seeds uh, on each one in order for them to be able to, to communicate. Okay. So that, okay, so that scenario we would definitely need to be able to have to specify seeds. Yeah, so same same with the Insta cluster one. And we <clears throat> we ended up, there's a patch uh, in Cassandra um, and kind of patch waiting in Cassandra for this as well. But we ended up changing the way the simple seed provider worked when it came to resolving um, IP addresses from a DNS record. Um, so we would actually just pass in a Kubernetes service um, record um, to the simple seed provider. <clears throat> and then we had a patch to only, you know, take n number of IP addresses um, from the service record. Well, um, Kubernetes does guarantee order of the IP addresses from the service record, I believe, if you configure it correctly as well. Um, so, you know, we'll kind of get the, the consistent um, seeds occurring there. Um, but then, as, as Frank mentioned, we also allow you to override that. It's not, it's not an override um, as such in the CRD spec itself. Um, we have a mechanism where um, you can provide, um, you know, kind of uh, whatever the, the, the config resources or the file resource within Kubernetes. Um, you can drop YAML fragments in there as overrides. Um, so, you know, that was our primary config override mechanism. Um, and you could certainly override, you know, the seed provider that way if, if you wanted to. Um, but I think it's this whole topic, you know, around the, the inline and also the seeds and the discovery, it, you know, I think we'll quickly kind of keep hitting on the fact that, you know, Kubernetes kind of multi-region or multi-cluster story, is still ill-defined at, at best. Um, so I think we want to leave as much flexibility for ourselves once that starts to solidify upstream. Can I ask you a question? So uh, this is this is uh, something that we had in mind. So you you have your own, I guess, seed provider class, right? That's what you were talking about by by the patch or the code that. Does yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah, yeah, custom. Yeah. yeah. So we wanted to do to you to do something like that, but like you said, Kubernetes doesn't support uh, multi. I mean, uh, I don't remember the name, but um, not replication, but uh, Federation yet. Uh, so as soon as it does, yeah, we could just have our own provider that will talk to uh, Kubernetes itself to know exactly what are the nodes that are part of the same cluster and, and just set automatically those seeds. So, so we thought about doing that, um, uh, having a thing that talks to Kubernetes, but this kind of opens up a lot more security doors than you probably want to. Like it's, it's much more desirable if the Cassandra pod like 
doesn't have any privileges to do anything with with cube right like so so we didn't do that but yeah it's something we thought of too i think we were talking about just you know getting nodes belonging to a service or to a cluster and just getting their ips nothing else so no no other privileges i mean nothing yeah scary. i mean I, i'm yeah i'm with you obviously I mean, you can... be able to do gets but um it's still more burden, right? It's still harder to install. It still requires more RBAC, you know? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of more on the side of, well, as like sticking through like the DNS mechanism. Um, Cause you know, with a bit of massaging, you can get Kubernetes to give you the information you need through the service record. Um, and, and then Cassandra will get that through like a DNS query, not through an actual query of the Kubernetes API. Um, and it does simplify that permissions model a bit. Why, I'm not sure I, I follow the discussion. Does, why would you need the seed, why would you need a seed provider to query the the API server versus just being able to query the, the service? Who's the question for? Anyone uh, or anyone, I, I guess either in or for Ben or, or Cyril. Um, so I was, no, I mean, I was talking about the seed provider class because this is just a way to set seeds without having to change the configuration anyhow. So the node would just know how to get the seed list without you having to, or anything having to configure the, 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 the Cassandra node. That's just it. So it will be more oh. dynamic if you can say so. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, if it was, if it was just self-discovering through the Kubernetes API, it means like you don't have to set anything other than just like Kubernetes seed provider and it auto looks up. Whereas I guess at like our approach, you have to inject the, the, the um, Kubernetes service DNS name. Um, but I mean, you know, it, like you got to inject a lot of other <clears throat> stuff. And I mean, it does mean that with the service record, you've got to create that up front and you've got to allow it to be queryable before the service marks itself is ready. So it means you then have like two different service records, one that is like, based on, um, you know, when it marks itself as ready and all the checks pass, um, and then a seed specific service so that it can kind of use that before everything's ready and, and do discovery that way. Um, you know, yeah, I, 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 that, that would be my understanding of the differences between those two approaches. And I, I, will, I will go on record saying, I think both of these are kind of a crutch around the, the need for Kubernetes to have a better way of managing this kind of service discovery that just is not available yet. Um, th this is a different discussion having in a different Kubernetes world, but um, the fact like something like a seed provider should be a part of service discovery. And, and it's just not available yet. So any mechanism that's put into the operator, I think is, has got to just work around the fact that it doesn't exist in, inside of the service discovery network. Yeah, I'd agree, I'd agree with that. I mean, you know, I, it would be nice to have a Kubernetes API based one because it simplifies and from a configuration and a, just a, a design perspective, but you know, you throw in the, the RBAC stuff and you know, that's, that's why we ended up going with, state with the DNS record. Yeah, and it, that's a change on Kubernetes, not a change on operator. <laughs> so that is out of scope in this. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so. I, I think the one takeaway I think that, that I Ben mentioned is flexibility. So I, I think um, we're at a point where less is more and 
Um, so I will, let me, I'll switch back over to the doc and, and move on. Um, oh, I have it to do for adding something for the, for the pod disruption budget. Uh, so I think, I think all the operators are using a, a disruption budget. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head which ones expose some of that. I know some of them, at least some of them do, I forget. Uh, the, and I think I put it to do just because I thought uh, that would be something to at least expose that. There are, I think, you know, reasonable defaults, but there may be scenarios where users want to allow to go beyond that for maintenance situations, for example. I think it may depend on the replication factor that they have, or I may be wrong. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and the operator doesn't know what it is. So that's why if you have different replication on diff the racks, for example, you may be able to specify. That's why we allow for that specification. I think that's that is everything. Like I said I, I um, the other thing, let me let me go back up to the questions really quick and see. So I think that's all I had to say on from that doc from last week for now. Just. Does anyone else any any more what any any more discussion questions comments otherwise? Okay, then I will switch gears for to the talk about storage. Yeah. Just one question. If you said earlier that you wanted to, to start from the the most common, the biggest common uh, things, but what if we have other things that we want to, that we we have added over time? Uh, how do we discuss that? Is that going to be later on or at the second stage or no? Um, I am flexible. I mean, it, well, I, if, you know, if you want to go ahead and yeah, take the I'll pass no, the range. No, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to go to volumes. I mean, that's good. that's good storage in volumes. Uh, I was just th th thinking in general. So maybe yeah. we go through the different fields and we we say after that. Okay. Yeah. Or or yeah. If or or if there's something a particular area that you know you'd like me to try to, you know, I'm trying to carve out so much time a week to devote uh, toward this. So if there's a particular area. Let me know and, and I'll, I'll try to make that happen um, and just be prepared for me to bombard you with questions. Um, all right. So, uh, okay. So we have the, we have, oh, I have, I'm missing the most important thing the uh, data directory for Cassandra here the logs, debug logs, GC logs, heap dump. Uh, if you're doing, if you're running a, a profiler, and then any storage requirements for sidecars, they're all things, or or, or uh, as well as any uh, maybe others, for which we need volumes. The default data directory for Cassandra, everything gets stored under varlib Cassandra, and then the logs get stored under var logs Cassandra, uh, and just a briefly showed what's done in CAS operator. Um, and then an example in, from CASCOP. This is only not, the examples here are just focusing on the, the spec, not what, not what actually gets the operator generates. In CAS operator, you can configure, fully configure the, um, 
the persistent volume claim for the data directory. So that would conf uh, for the, what for Varlib Cassandra and in Cascop, the volume claim is not directly exposed. You can specify the, the capacity and the storage class and the, uh, the rest is, is uh, abstracted or implementation. But then Cascop also does provide support in the spec for additional uh, storage, um, storage configuration. And this is when I wound up pinging Cyril to ask for some examples and point me to some examples. And I, and I included a couple of the examples that he referred me to for, um, for example, so with the, the sidecar, and you see here where it is, it was a sidecar with the logs and actually just the um, CAS operator, and I know it actually does the same thing. It's just, it's not exposed in the, in this, or almost, if not the same, almost the same uh, with respect to the logs. It's just not um, configurable through the spec. Uh, so, so, sorry, one question. So you're saying it does the same, but it's not configurable. configurable. So you cannot add sidecar, I guess, or you can? can I'm not yeah. sure. You can now. We added it. Oh, okay. That was in the last release, but um, all the stuff with like a adding storage mounts, I don't think we support or want to support today. Um, but I do think we we eventually want to support them, so we just haven't worked on it yet. So seeing okay. how, seeing how you all do it is very interesting. Um, but yeah, the tailing tailing the log sidecars. So yeah, we have we stand up one of those in our default thing. So okay, so that's where you use it. Yeah, okay. the, the 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 Cassandra container is actually the man the logs for or the management API, which is not really ideal. It confuses everybody, but it's maybe just an issue of naming things better. Um, so the the server logs are tailed like this in another container. Okay. Would you, are you, Cyril, are you okay with talking for a few minutes about what the um, CASCOP sure. does? Okay. Sure. Uh, you want me to, I mean, we can see it on the, um, on the screen, I guess. I was going to share but the documentation, but it's the same, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think it's the same. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, uh, we are able to define uh, storage volumes, and those volumes are aimed to be mounted by uh, sidecar, sidecar containers. So, for example, we want to be able to send logs, uh, the, the garbage, uh, collection uh, collector logs, or we want to be able to have some particular probes uh, listening to special events. I mean, it's, a, it's not up to us, it's more up to the, to the sysadmin or the ops uh, who want to have more control and more, you know, um, add their own props or something that they define or develop before and that is already running on prod. So, of course, we're trying to talk to them and, and discuss and, and, and try to figure out if uh, it makes sense or not. But uh, usually, I mean, if they need it, we need to provide a way for them to use it. So uh, here we have two ways to do it. The first one is the, the storage volumes uh, where they can, they can mount a particular sp uh, uh, spaces uh, in order to access logs, to access anything that is on the Docker containers. Uh, and uh, the other one is the sidecar. And in the sidecar, you just specify the mount volumes that you want to access. And those mount volumes are, uh, are just the, the storage volumes that we defined earlier. So you, you can decide what you want to mount for which sidecar, and then you can have access to it and use it. It's then on you to be sure to not, you know, overwrite data that is used by Cassandra, uh, of course. Um, 
but yeah, in our case, it's more yeah for logs and uh, I think it's for logs and like we said, the the maybe if there is a heap a dump or um, exposed to the world. Uh, yes, yes, the garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We th this this is one thing that we we hate. Uh, we cannot have access to the stop the word uh, metrics directly. Uh, it's something that you need to enable on the JVM uh, for it to uh, log how much time a stop the word uh, uh, takes. And um, so we have to do it. And it's another, it's in another uh, log file. And we have to be able to, you know, send this log file. Uh, I think this is pretty much it. Uh, I'm trying to look, but I don't think there is much to see. And uh, when we define a sidecar, I mean, sidecar containers, we just use the, the you know, the existing type, which is V1, I mean, um, which is just container. And th that way you can uh, configure or define everything that you want at the container level. We don't put any limit on it. Um, I, uh, does, do you all ever use, um another volume for commit logs or no we use the same more than one okay or 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 more than one data volume no we don't okay yeah uh so that's a that's one of the questions uh, one of the things i captured below thank you cyril and so I, I i like the flexibility really like the and i wanted to have this example here because i like the flexibility um, and then, I, but I also, and I also like, and to me, and it's, to me, it's a, say it's a, a kind of like a, a best practice. You, you want to have those logs, the system logs exposed. So I like the fact, I also like the fact it has an operator. I don't need to have, think about it. It's just, it's there. You get that out of the box. Um, and then the other thing I thought about is I was trying to capture some ideas was that there are, so in, in so the work that I do, there'll be times where, I might working with different uh, customers. I'll need I need the um, system logs. I might need the debug log for I want if I want to look for example slow, slow query logs, um, or I might need you know the uh, the GC log. Now I'm dealing 99% of the time, 99.9% of the time with clusters that are not running in Kubernetes, so it's easy to get these things. But in Kubernetes it's a different story. And so I want, for me, I want at least to have the flexibility to sit, you know, to be able to, without too much configuration, make these different things accessible. Um, and, or as like Jim raised the question about, or maybe I want to put the commit log on a different volume. Uh, and so, oh, where did I go? So what I started sketching out, not too, long before the meeting was since we know that there's a number of explicitly defining the so not too different than what we've already seen well in some regards having a a, um, a volume claim for the data volume so here's what i was trying to strive for didn't really figure it out having a by default a volume claim for your data directory, so varlib Cassandra, and doing what's already doing with the logs, where basically a sidecar container like is commonly done for tailing the logs, but providing the flexibility to, uh, to define other volumes to override those defaults, whether whether that is for for example. If I want to put the commit log on a separate directory, um, on a separate volume, or if I'm doing trying to trouble doing some troubleshooting and I want to go ahead and put the um, GC logs on a separate volume, but maybe on a persistent volume, I'm dealing with an unstable node, uh, or or, for, or to capture heap dumps, and then the um, and then I have the the, the additional volumes for 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 sidecars or other sidecars like backup restore as an example or any other sidecars that you might might be using the challenge that 
was trying to couldn't really sort out is the the fact that um, you know you, you can't have separate distinct volume mounts with you know with the same base path. I mean the, it's going to be the last mount wins. Um, so I didn't really completely sort it out, but that's that's what I was um, striving for. Or so and, and with what I have here, um, let me see here. Um, yeah, I was looking at some. I was looking at some examples and where, and I don't where they're using with the um, um, subpath mounts for sub, sharing a volume mount uh, to for the um, different directories under Varlib Cassandra. Um, I'm not sure if that helps achieve that flexibility that I was describing. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean. I see. I see. This. That was just an example because I see the same volume mounted twice. I mean, the the first two have a subpath, but the last one doesn't. Is it because something is missing, or you, yeah, maybe. I'm wondering what that one is going to do because you have two subpaths already. And then the last one oh, is the yeah, base that's path. So yeah, that's the yeah that shouldn't okay that's an error yeah I need to fix that. Um, so on on the on the logging side, <clears throat> is that something that we would maybe just leave up to logback and just leave it as a logback configuration? So if people want to write it to a volume somewhere, they can do it. But if you know they want to push those logs somewhere else using log back to do that, like that would be my gut feel on that. My so as I was thinking about this beforehand, I thought there should be a reasonable default, um, like you have now. It seems like that. For example, with the system logs being tailed in um, to an, an empty deer volume, um, or if you you want to yeah send them somewhere else and not have and, and try to co do so in a way that's going to minimize the number of places that the end user is going to have to touch to to make that change. Ideally, it's just one change in the spec, one property to do it. I would consider a, a victory. Yeah, because I, I think because my understanding is Kubernetes like the the basic logging is is with a with a given process in a container. If you're logging to stand it out, it kind of collects that into the 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 logging system in Kubernetes, and you know that would be a pretty reasonable default. It is a default, I think, right? Right. Yeah. It, it, the issue is that we have many files getting written to as like logs, which is not cloud native for whatever. Well, you could. It's worth. But that, I mean, that, that's just the logback configuration, though. Like you can you can yeah. change that to all be stand, you know, to, yeah. to all do standard out. You could do the slow query log. You can do the GC pauses. Yeah, sure, but the, all those Java Java logs are not. I don't know that they're configurable at all. You can, if you can redirect where those go, then you can flush everything to. Um, I think it's like Dev Standard Out or whatever. Like the standard nginx container does that to to make its logging adiabatic because you know nginx is the same thing, right? It has an access log and an error log, but. Um, then, yeah, then, with logback, you can you can have it go to standard out. You can have it go yeah. to a syslog server yeah, or whatever that, you want to do. Yeah, that's no problem. But then the issue with this is um, untangling that is just like a mess. Like if you if you subscribe to like an Elk Stack provider and say, hey, here are my logs. Like they're just gonna drop this stuff on the floor because it's not gonna parse. 
So I do think actually keeping these things as like separate streams because the format for the GC logs is like consistent with itself. Like you could write a parser for that, but you're never going to write a good parser for it mixed in with the Cassandra logs, mixed in with the um, full full query logs or what I haven't ever. I don't know if I've even seen that format. Um, some months, well, but... you, I, I mean, again, going back to logback, you can define how each log is generated and tagged, and you know, so you can stru you can structure it so you can get there. I'm not sure you can send uh, I mean, GC log using logback. The, I think the, it's yeah, different. The, the, yeah. the GC log GC might log be the GV exception much. for sure. Yeah, yeah that gets confused. GV okay. much. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure later Java also seems to have like a Java system log thing that's kind of logging stuff about like classes loading and I'm, st I'm still, I just started using Java 14. I'm still trying to figure out like what changed at what versions of Java, but there, there's some new logs, so yeah. So the, Id so the ideal scenario is users have prob presumably have a Ideal scenario is I have a centralized logging system that's capturing, it looks at elk stack, capture my logs, I have structured logs, but certainly starting out, a lot of people, maybe most, aren't going to be in that ideal scenario, right? No, I think if you're a serious Kubernetes shop, you have to get that set up right away. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so someone running Cassandra in production and saying like, we, we have no, like, yeah, like, Basically, you have to give it ready to them in some shape to hand off. Like the volumes that that serials, that the example that's great. Like that's perfect. I just mean like we kind of can't do much better than that. And like asking somebody to like exec in to look at that volume is like that's where they should have invested in something like Elk Stack, right? Like we can't do better than that. But it means they're not really doing their their end of the deal here but, but yeah i don't think forcing these things to be jammed together or forcing people to use log back to redefine stuff that's like kind of quite the opposite from what you'll find in most kubernetes apps so here, let me put myself in so one of the things that we do that my team does is we'll use a tool use some internal tools that will and it's basically just some shell scripts that'll do and, and scrape nodes and again this is outside of kubernetes um, and it will um, collect logs and various metrics and so forth. And as you know, I've thought before, like, well, how would that work apply in the Kubernetes world? And if, and if you're not using, you know, and, if, and, if, and a lot of times, you know, it could be on clusters that are unstable and so that maybe there's some volatility. And so, you know, I, I could easily see a scenario where, well, you've got, a, you've got your settings and, your, your logs are being, are not persistent and are trying to use our tool and say, oh, we don't have any of the logs, so we're not able to do a lot of the analysis. And then the customer says, okay, well, what can we do so that we don't lose the logs? And being able to be able to solve that problem without going through a lot of pain. So they can, yeah, we don't lose the logs. Yep, totally. Yeah, having, having some log retention built into the pod. And, is... and of course, the, the better solution would be Hey, centralized logging, but that's that's a separate concern. Right. You, well, you're going to want both, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey guys, just a heads up. I'm going to have to drop, but um, thanks for the discussion, everyone, and um, thanks for uh, all the uh, answers you fielded to my questions. Much appreciated. Yeah, um, and I will also point out we are at the top of the hour. Um, we do have a meeting scheduled for next week. Uh, if we're at a good stopping place, John. That was a question. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling, I'm asking. <laughs> All right, we're at a good spot to stop? I'm good. Okay. So uh, I will post this recording in the next couple of days. Um, it's always fun to be the YouTube guy, because by the way, YouTube has gotten a really cool setup. <laughs> and I'm gonna say that while we're recording so they can hear that and the Google Lords will bless me. Um, but um, 
<laughs> I will get this going. Uh, again, we have a meeting next week. Uh, we'll pick this up from there. Um, John, if there's anything in between, just put it up on the Slack. All right. Thanks, everyone.